Blog Talk Radio. Desperate House Witches. I'm Rena Star, so you don't have to be. <laughs> Desperate House Witches is not a G, PG, or even an R-rated show. So, if bad language, bodily function, dirty talk of any kind might offend you, this show is probably not for you. But uh, we all know that's why you show up. Desperate House Witches is brought to you by the amazingly wicked one herself, the incredible Dorothy Morrison. Please go to the social media page on Facebook for Desperate House, for Desperate House which is for WickedWitchStudios.com. She is currently selling those amazing sugar skull, sugar skull coffin boxes. I am so sorry, guys. Um, and you can get them with candles, with oils, with all kinds of things. It is fantastic. Darcy Morrison is fantastic. All of her things are fantastic, so check out the social media page for all of that good stuff. Okay, so, want to register a complaint. I am sitting here feeling horrible, and I am trying to take COVID tests. Now, here is the interesting thing about the COVID test. Take it with a swab, and these suckers did not put the swab in the box. So I am sitting here with this COVID test because I feel like shit, and I can't even swab. So annoying because I was going to do the swab live on the air. Um, But my guest is in the queue, so I'm going to bring on his wonderful self, Kobe Michael. Hang on. Hey, Kobe. Hey there. How are you doing? Hey, darling. I was just telling everybody that I am actually trying to find a swab <laughs> because my COVID test did not come with one, and I'm feeling a little covid but I'm glad you're here. <laughs> yeah, I'm Maybe glad to be here, me. too. <laughs> it has been quite a while since the last time we talked. The last time we talked, it was about your first book, Um The Poison Path Herbal, fabulous book. Everybody, get the book. It will help you in ways you can't even imagine. But today we're going to talk about Leo Witch. Oh, my God. So before we get to all that, how are you? How have you been? I'm doing pretty well. I'm just kind of coming out of the, the summer sort of slow season and getting everything ready for October and uh, I actually had COVID at the beginning of August, which was the first time I have ever had it. So that was that was fun. Yes, this this if I have it, which I may or may not, and I have found the swab. <laughs> so I am going to do this live on the air. Um, All right. That is not, but that's not why we're here. We're actually here because of this book, Leo Witch, and you know it is one of the the Sun Sign series that. Um, Eva Dominguez Jr., whom we all love and adore, um, Mm -hmm. has been co-writing with a bunch of our favorite other authors. So, Kobe, how did you get approached for Leo Witch? What was the genesis of this book coming about? Well, I was asked by Evo to contribute for this one, um, I think just through... Uh, blogging on on Patheos Pagan. I think there's a handful of us on there that have been part of the Patheos family for a few years now and and just kind of being vocal and open about being a Leo. Uh, So he reached out and invited me to uh, co-author with him and always really liked his approach 
to astrology and also kind of tying in the pagan and magical aspect of it, too. Uh, He's got a really awesome book that's called uh, Astrology for Witches and Pagans. It's kind of been like an indispensable sort of resource uh, for me personally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Evo is is famous for his writing, um, some of his guided meditations, uh, so many different things. Such a well-rounded elder of our community, and I just love him to pieces. I, I miss speaking with him. He's been very busy, as everybody knows, doing all kinds of things and, and of course, working on these books. So tell me about what makes a Leo so dynamic and amazing in your opinion, being a Leo yourself, of course. I am not a Leo. I'm a Libra. <laughs> so I feel very connected to you because I know you were raised by Libras. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, can see, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> but you talk about, you talk about glamour magic and, and the different aspects of glamour magic. I think people, when they hear the term glamour magic, they're really thinking more of a physical attraction type of situation, but that's really not the sole embodiment of glamouring, is it? No, it's really a, a very personal and an inner thing. And I think when we first start out, um, you know, working glamour magic and wanting to project these auras to bring specific things into our life or to um, you know, make other people more responsive to our desires and things like that. We sort of get um, caught up in, in maybe the, the darker side of glamour magic or what would maybe be, you know, felt by some people to be a little bit more manipulative, but kind of digging into that and like where that desire to, to glamour in the first place comes from um, can teach us a lot about who we are and how we interact with the world and you know, it's really a, a matter of, of personal expression and personal empowerment and kind of reflecting that out into the world around us. So seeing that you come from a very interesting background, I don't want to go too deep if you're not comfortable with that, but you've been through a lot of stuff, I think it's safe to say. How has how, how has being a Leo helped you as far as that aspect of, you know, those aspects of your personality to, to pull you out of darker times and darker things? Um, well, I was just listening to a song today, and one of the lines was that it was in the darkness that I learned to shine. Um, and that really kind of hit home and, and is really like a core to who I am as, as a magical practitioner and, and working and, and delving into the darker side of some of these things um, is really, you know, that's sort of the main thing that I do. So to be so um, so dominated by the sun and, and the light, as far as my astrology goes and and almost be expected to be this very like gregarious um, people person outgoing kind of a being uh, which for for many many years i I was not uh, you know I've been very introverted and and kind of kept myself hidden and and lived a very sort of uh, in my own head kind of life for a while and I think that was really <clears throat> a survival mechanism for me. And you kind of can, yeah. I think, get so so deeply caught up in your own thought process and your own healing and your own shadow work that it can almost have a little bit of a, a detrimental effect. Uh, so it's that Leo side of, um, you know, wanting to be seen and wanting to be accepted and, and also wanting to kind of lift other people up in the same way uh, that's been, you know, super helpful getting me through some of these more difficult times. Um, because if you can light up other people's lives and, and help other people and, and, you know, touch other people's hearts, even if you're, you know, maybe not in the the best place or you're stuck in the shadows, um, you know, I think that says a lot about a person's character and, you know, that we can go through these, these dark times, but, you know, we can also 
see the light reflected in other people around us and our interactions with them. Yeah, you know, it's funny because obviously I was raised around very old, the, the very stereotypical meanings of the signs, and you always expect Leos to be gregarious and, you know, out in front and very, you know, lead follower, get the fuck out of my way, so to speak, Um and it's not, it's not, that's not the soul embodiment. The, the archetypes that we tend to throw on, on sun signs isn't necessarily accurate, and we can't expect everybody to act a certain kind of a way all the time. That's, that, that, that's always my takeaway. It's like there's so many things that are applicable to all this. Like Libra, for example, you know, you being raised by Libra, you were around, you know, the the things of art and beauty, and and those are the things you gravitated towards because those are the things you were raised around. But it doesn't necessarily mean, it doesn't necessarily make up your entire being because there are other planetary influences, and I, I often have to remind myself, you know, just because a person is a certain sign doesn't make them cut off from being like other archetypes, depending on the rising sign and, and um, you know, the ascendant. And so how, how much of, of incorporating astrology have you done in your magic previous to this? Um, <clears throat> the main, I guess, astrological work that I would do in my own personal practice is kind of comes from um, astrological timing, uh, mainly with the moon, actually. Uh, so I don't know if that's mm-hmm. just like a, a witchcraft thing because so much of what we do kind of hinges around what the moon is doing, um, but paying attention right. to, you know, what sign the moon is in. And that's something that changes like pretty frequently too. So there's a little bit more um, to work with there as opposed to something that, you know, is a little bit more long-term, whether it's a month or a year, or however the, however long the transit takes. Yeah, that's true. Did you learn anything specific that you didn't already know about yourself in the process of writing this? Yes. (laughs) Um, So I was invited to write this book and sort of... you know, not, not speak for the other, other Leos because I would never ever dream of of doing anything like that, but I'm kind of being put in this position where I'm, I'm sort of redefining myself in the framework of, of being a Leo. And for a lot of years, I always used to tell people that, you know, I wasn't really the greatest Leo or like the greatest embodiment of what a Leo is, is typically thought to be. Um, I think a lot of those those more positive or outgoing qualities kind of got shut down at an early age and and turned inward and so it was it was kind of a difficult process writing this actually um just really having to dive into you know parts of my personality that I didn't think were good enough or didn't think were were representative enough of you know all of these other fabulous leos out there um, you know so it was almost like a little bit of imposter syndrome um but it it wound mm-hmm. up being a really great journey and kind of unpacking all of that those misconceptions that I had about myself from a a younger age and kind of to to where I'm at now and different things that I've overcome that have allowed some of those aspects to manifest a little bit more. And I'm glad you said that because I think people get thrown by they should as far as, you know, living up to or down to the aspects of their astrological sign. I think that's why you have to have so many, you know, levels of input from, I mean, if if all Leos were the same, that book would have been written a couple of times and that would have been it. So Mm -hmm. to incorporate and appreciate the other aspects is really important, I feel, to make a whole person as opposed to just 
caricature, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I see a lot of <clears throat> influences from my, my Pisces rising and, and definitely like oh, yeah. my Aries moon as far as, you know, my personality and how I interact with the world. And, um, you know, the, the sun sign is kind of just like a, a general overall flavoring, I guess, of, of the energies that the, the universe or the solar system was, was transmitting at that time that gets spread out to, you know, all of the other people born on that day um, or during that, yep. that sun sign. But we get these, these little nuances of, of how the sun sign gets tweaked by the moon sign and, and just looking at, you know, like the relationship between the sun and the moon and, and how they, they affect one another and, and reflect that light. You know, the, the moon sign is very much, you know, a, a reflection of, of some of those more inner workings. Yeah, parts I'm, that we don't I'm, necessarily I'm an, show everyone. Yeah, I'm an astrological disaster area. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> Libra sun, a Pisces moon, and Capricorn rising, and I'm like, ah, uh, shit. And I didn't even know. I've, I've been, I had been, well, here's the thing. I have been told for so many years something different about my rising sign, and I was like, okay, that makes sense, sort of. You know, because depending on who you've gone to for a chart or whatever, you may get a different answer. It should be the same answer, but it's not always. So I was told, you know, a whole bunch of things about, well, you've got all these planets in Scorpio. I'm like, yeah, I know. So, I mean, and I always attributed that to my bitchy personality. But no, apparently, (laughs) I'm a wuss. I cry easily. And because of my Capricorn rising, it's like, yeah, whatever. I don't care. (laughs) So I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a mess astrologically, I feel. Um, it's hard enough to be a Libra, but then you throw a Pisces moon on top of that. Ugh, no wonder I'm so emotional. I mean, and, you know, anything that happens to me is very much like being on a roller coaster. I've got super high highs, really low lows. Um, Not quite manic depressive. I've not been clinically diagnosed with that. Just, you know, regular run-of-the-mill depression or, you know, Actually, not even depression. I'm, I've been diagnosed with anxiety disorder, which I think most of my friends have. I, I don't know anybody actually off the top of my head that doesn't have anxiety disorder. What about you? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, just like regarding the anxiety disorder, not to like, you know, belittle or or discount anyone that actually has been diagnosed with it, but it seems like generalized anxiety is just kind of becoming, you know, part of the norm. of of life in a modern world and, and who we are and what we've been through and, and what we're faced with now. I think, you know, a lot of us are struggling with what to do with the anxiety and um yeah, it can be a it can be a difficult, tricky journey. It really is. I mean, I don't know if it's just like in the past 10 years or so, or, or, I mean, I I haven't really nailed it down, nailed it down. It just seems like, you know, it was always a rare thing. I'm a lot older than you, and it was always a rare thing to talk about, you know, mental illness or just how you're doing mentally. I mean, it was such a taboo subject for such a long time. And it's so wonderful that now we can actually say these things out loud, and I'm a big proponent about talking about it um, because it was something hidden for so many decades. Certainly in my family, there's loads of mental issues. I mean, my father was a Pisces and, you know, clinically ill, mentally ill, manic depression, Mm -hmm. um, OCD, um, had a lot of different things, but they weren't diagnosed back then because they didn't discuss it back then. It was very, he's just a nervous person. No, he wasn't a nervous person. He was a dangerous person um, Mm -hmm. because he was a violent person. So, I mean, 
and it was just interesting because you know you try I tried as a child to appeal to the Pisces side of him, the emotional side of him, but unfortunately he was so damaged that he like a lot of that was cut off, and and I find that you know you know hurt people hurt people, and I find that a lot of folks in certain astrological settings do behave a certain way to severe damage. And I just found that very interesting, um, you know, because it's now the norm. It's more the norm now than the exception that we're all dealing with something, you know, or mm -hmm. like I don't think I know anybody personally in my, like in my personal sphere who isn't either dealing with it through counseling or some kind of medication. It's it's such a open thing now that I think maybe we've all been dealing with it all along. We just didn't have license to talk about it until now. What do you think? Yeah, I think you know it's <clears throat> the just the need for like diagnosis or to put a label on something or or put someone in a box that are kind of sets them apart. Uh, you know, and a lot of times it's needed for, for further medical treatment and support, but I I would totally agree that I don't think that there is a, a person on the planet that couldn't benefit from, you know, some kind of counseling, some kind of therapy, or or doesn't have something, whether it's, you know, from their childhood or chemical imbalance or, or just, you know, deeply buried trauma um, that there's not anyone around that doesn't have something to work through or something that they're struggling with. And I think that talking about it and not being afraid to show people that messier side um, kind of normalizes it and, and gives people a sense of, you know, sort of empathy and, and understanding when we're interacting with other people out in the world and that, you know, we're all kind of broken in one way or another, and we're all doing the best we can to navigate our, our yeah. day-to-day -day lives. I agree with you. And my and my only objection is, is when people use it as an excuse. It's, you know what I mean? Like, there are, there's, there's some people that are like, well, you know, you have to forgive me for being an asshole because this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, I no longer find that to be... Like, in, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I no longer find that to be an acceptable excuse for being a dick. Because <laughs> a lot of people have some really dicky behavior, and they're like, yeah, but it's because I have this or I have that. And I'm like, well, everybody's got this or that. So it's kind of like we have to stop. We I think we have to be careful of of how much we want to bring out the kit gloves in situations because I think, like you said, we're all dealing with something and, you know, it's, and words have meaning or they don't and they it all has credence or it doesn't. So I just hope folks will, you know, before they want to just throw around excuses for being assholes, that maybe you consider the fact that we're all we're all dealing with somebody or something that we're going through rather and you know just to kind of just be nice to each other in general just to be nice <laughs> sorry i guess i've been dealing with some folks who have been having um excuse issues as opposed to dealing with their shit so i thought maybe other people are going through that too so i thought i'd throw that out there but um, I wanted to ask, in writing this book, did you see any behavior traits that you felt were stereotypical but not accurate? Hmm. Stereotypical but not accurate. Um, I guess kind of coming from this idea that that Leos are automatically like in these leadership roles or that we want to like rule people or boss people around or, or always sort of be the, the center of attention spotlight. And I think that, that that kind of gets 
misconstrued in that, you know, we don't all necessarily have these these really big, unbreakable egos, but we're actually pretty delicate little kittens, and it really comes from Aww. a place of, <laughs> yeah, you know, just wanting other people to, to see us for who we are um, and kind of, you know, validate yeah. back and forth and, and you know, really just to to be loved and needed and accepted. And it's very much, like, centered around, um, you know, the heart. And Leos are, are ruled by the heart, the, the energy center. Yeah. And so we kind of have this, this need for approval almost. Um, but for whatever reason, we're kind of hardwired to make other people feel good, Um and I think that that tends to attract people, which kind of puts us in these situations that, you know, are maybe a leadership role, but not necessarily um, in the way that, that Gemini is a, a leader. Uh, it's a little bit different, I think. Interesting. Very interesting. Because when I think of a Leo, I think of, like, Mick Jagger, who, you know, kind of became – the leader of the Rolling Stones by, it's so still really, I mean, he just, you know, it defaulted to him because the original leader had passed away and had gotten kicked out of the band. And I think people look at someone like that and think that that's a stereotypical Leo. But I find that Leos are often mischaracterized as being like egomaniacs and, you know, like like you said earlier, um, needing to be the center of attention. I think, you know, the whole thing about, from my interactions with Leos, is that, you know, basically, like you said, you're all a bunch of big, sweet kittens that just want to be loved. <laughs> and it's really, but when you're in a Leo's sphere of influence and energy, you know, the sunlight kind of shines on, not just them, but everyone around them, which is why I think Leos are so um, enigmatic and fun to be around. While not all of you guys are gregarious necessarily 100% of the time, you do, you, you are quick-witted and you are, you know, fun and you do know how to break a bad mood for other people. It's not necessarily for yourself. Do you think that's true? Yeah, we just want everybody to have a good time and feel comfortable. And I think that's why we're known for kind of being the life of the party, um, because we want, you know, we want people to be comfortable and, and be happy and feel like they can be themselves. And in a way, I think that is kind of giving us permission to then be ourselves when everyone else around us is, is feeling comfortable. Has it changed how you deal with like writing this book? Has it has it changed how you deal with people in your personal life? Um, I don't know if it's changed it, but reinforced it. Um, you know, I've always had my hands in a lot of different things, and it's always been about um, you know sharing other people's work and networking and and kind of being like this connecting factor. Um, between people in the the magical community and and whether it relates to my work directly or I just happen to see like a way that that two other practitioners could connect and benefit from it uh, that brings me a lot of joy and happiness in in kind of being the one that can you know, help kind of start those relationships. So you know how, like, in the old days, and I I don't know that they necessarily do this anymore, but there used to be this list of this this sign should never interact with that sign in a relationship, yada, yada, yada. Did, mm-hmm. did this writing reinforce any of those kind of stereotypes for you? Like, you know, I know I would never get along with this, sign in a personal relationship or anything like that? I think for for me, for Leo's, um, the one that that comes to mind is the Leo-Aries combination and and that not always 
ending so well. Um, it can start out great, oh. but then it tends to, to kind of implode on itself. And just kind of thinking about that, and like a lot of my closest friends are Aries, and just a lot of the people that, that I come across happen to be in that um, Aryan nature. And, and sometimes it really annoys the shit out of me and gets under my skin and I just don't want to be around them. <laughs> but then they're also like, you know, like the most loyal and, and, you know, friends that you can really, really count on. So I think it's just sort of fire and fire and get us together and it can kind of be a little bit too much for both of us. But in the end, it's, it's, it's a really good thing. So Arians would definitely be better off as being friends with Leos, but not necessarily in a in an intimate relationship, right? Yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh my god. So <laughs> yeah, I've 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 been through the the stereotypical stuff where. I'm like, okay, so this particular sign is like poison to me, and most of my relationships were with this. Like, okay, so I'm not supposed to deal with Aquarians, really. And I was married to two of them previously, and that was a fucking nightmare, of course, because um, they're, you know, they they are very um, go with the flow. They don't plan very well. I'm only speaking about the ones I have dealt with. It's just that there's been a lot of them that I've dealt with, and I'm just saying. And I don't know what it is in my personality as a Libra that attracts that that dreamer, not practical uh, type of personality. Finally, I smartened up and married a Cancerian who is, like, perfect. But why is it we tend to want to be in relationships with signs that are just not healthy for us. Yeah, I don't know why that is. Part of me almost wonders if, you know, we hear about those those bad matches on, like, horoscope websites and things like that where they'll pair everybody up and say whether it's going to be a good or a bad relationship. I almost wonder... If those pairings, if we look a little bit deeper at the characteristics of both of those signs, is there something sort of within that sign that is uncomfortable for us or something that we need to work on or for whatever reason kind of rubs us the wrong way because there's like a deeper sort of level of, of, of healing that, that is being awoken or, you know, touching on something that, that strikes a nerve or or really gets under your skin, it seems like, which, you know, in a lot of cases, those are sometimes the relationships that bring us the most growth. Um, you know, I know just in my yeah. previous relationships, <laughs> like sometimes the, the nastiest stuff is what really propels you forward and, and gets you to a really good place. It doesn't make it any less uncomfortable or, or nasty. Like, I, I would never, ever marry a, a Sagittarius or date a Sagittarius ever again. Um, no offense to oh, the Sagittarians, yeah. but, um, right. you know, those are, are very formative experiences, as uncomfortable as they are. I agree with you. And And you're probably right. It's probably that I needed to learn some kind of life lesson twice, two marriages in a row. Oh, what the <laughs> fuck was I thinking? You know, I'm the type of, and and it's so true. I, I'm i the type of person that you say, the stove is hot, but I still have to fucking check. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you just said it. I heard you. I comprehended the words that came out of your mouth. But son of a bitch, you just told me it was hot. Why do I need to then go behind you and double check like you were lying to me? It's one of those things, you know, like my first husband was three years younger than me and an Aquarian and a dreamer and an artist and all kinds of wonderful, and a witch and all these wonderful things. And then after that broke up, I said, okay, not only will I never again marry another Aquarian, but I'm going to make sure he's not younger than me. Well, of course, marriage number two, 
another Aquarian and not three years younger than me, but five years younger than me. Yeah, uh. we didn't learn. <laughs> yeah. So, mm, cute, she's not so fucking bright. So, yeah. <laughs> and I guess you're right. I didn't learn the lessons the first time. Made it worse the second time. <laughs> And yeah. finally got it right just before hitting my 40s. Yay! Finally, yeah. emotional growth and potential can happen. But it's interesting because <laughs> I do, you know, I don't necessarily read horoscopes like, like I don't read my daily horoscope. Is that something you do? Um, Not really. I think that a lot of horoscopes are are coming from sources that are, you know, maybe just looking to, like, get get page views or or clickbait type of things almost that I would be, you know, for fun, I think it's great. Or you you read some of, like, the the dark horoscopes or, like, you, um, oh, there was this one that it was, like, all of sort of the the stereotypical bad qualities and it just took it to the extreme and it was like hilarious to read Mm -hmm. them. Um. (laughs) Yeah. That's awesome. I think I've seen some of those too, where it's like, Libra, you think everyone's in love with you and you may be right, but still stop saying that shit. Yeah. Things like that (laughs) just crack me up. You know? Yeah. I, I mean, I do find the humor, but it's interesting to me because I find I don't know, and maybe it's just my my train of thought on this, but I always thought that reading astrology for folks that are not practitioners of any kind of magic or paganism of any kind, like it's their it's their way of dipping their toe in the water. You know what I mean? Like, well, I'm not really following witchcraft. I'm just looking at the stars and seeing what my day will be like. But that's really kind of a witchcraft thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think probably three, four hundred years ago, it probably could have gotten you in quite a bit of trouble if you were, you know, reading horoscopes and casting lots about how your day was going to go. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, I just just find that it's, you know, because astrology fits so well into magic. It doesn't really fit that well into, say, Christianity, as far as I can tell. So I always thought it was like, you know, well, it's like the cheater version of, of getting involved or going away from the church, so to speak, and just dipping that little toe in the paganism waters, the magical waters, come to the magical waters. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. So going back to the the Poison Path Herbal, which was a really fantastic book. Um Thank you. What you working on now? Are you working on a follow up to that? I actually just submitted the final or first manuscript of my next book, which will be the Poison Path Grimoire. So kind of taking, oh, oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's very, very witchcraft oriented, very, um, very practical as far as like a lot more of my own um, personal spells and rituals and, and really trying to give people different examples of how to incorporate poison as an occult um energy into their magical practice and then also working with the the specific plants for um you know more focused um intention you know drawing from their their magical correspondences so this one is a little bit more of a a spell book where the last one was more you know scientific practical kind of how to um so super excited for for that to come out I am too because and I know we're supposed to be talking about Leo Witch. And Leo Witch is a wonderful book. Go get it. As a matter of fact, go get all of the Sun Sign books because they're super cool. But I I fell in love with you from your first book, 100%. There is no doubt. So I'm hmm. like, yeah, I, if you don't mind us talking about the grimoire, um, can we talk for a few minutes about it? Is that okay? Yeah, Absolutely. 
Okay, cool. All right. So the first book you wrote, um, The Poison Path Herbal, obviously, is pre- it's really important that I, I – to me, it's really important that listeners who are interested – get that book first before your new book comes out because it has all the practical information that one would need um, be forecasting whatever it is you've got in the second book coming up. You said it was more spell work and stuff like that. But Mm -hmm. I learned a lot of things from the first book and, and you were even candid enough to say, yeah, you kind of maybe overdid a little bit of something, you know, experimenting and learning about um, an herb that was in the book and, and I just think it's really important that folks get that educational part of it first before mm-hmm. jumping on to the grimoire. Don't you think that's a good idea? Will they be sold as a set at some point? I have a lot of questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they they do definitely go together. And, uh, you know, a lot of the focus on the poison path is about how to work with the plant safely, um, especially when it comes mm-hmm. to, like, some of their their medicinal and mind-altering effects and actually physically, you know, applying or, or ingesting the herbs, um, but then also kind of reminding people that these are some of the most magical plants on the planet and very much tied to, um, you know, sort of the, the European pharmacopoeia of like witching herbs. And so very much connected to that story of, of witchcraft as it, as it developed, um, you know, throughout the old world and encompassing, you know, more of the, the Middle Eastern herbs and Mediterranean and, and Northwestern Europe. And, and that's very much part of the, the whole narrative of, of what we could call, you know, like traditional witchcraft as we know it. And to incorporate them into a practice ritually, um, setting kind of the, the poisonous and mind-altering effects aside, using them as magical allies, spiritual familiars, and really approaching this idea of, poison not only as a a physical substance but an occult and spiritual energy that we can connect with and direct into our rituals um, for you know all kinds of of different purposes like they're so versatile um, you know they're essentially the the witch's power plants Um, so if we were to have any sort of familiar spirits in the plant world it would be you know, mandrake, wolfsbane, deadly nightshade, um, those those plant allies that have been part of our journey as as magical people since the very, very beginning. Absolutely, and I'm glad you said that because that was something I wanted to say the last time you were on, and I didn't get a chance to, so I'm going to say it now. Um, and the idea is about plant spirits because, and plant familiars, and I, and I love that you brought that up again, because like me, there are many of us who are not able to take care of a an animal familiar. So, you know, and folks often feel like, well, if you can't have um, a, a, a living familiar, you know, a four-legged familiar or, or something of that nature, that you're kind of missing out part of your practice. But no, you can use plant spirits and plant familiars um, as your familiar. You don't have to have um, a creature, uh, an entity that you have to physically feed and walk or change the box to. Uh, and that was something that, that I meant to talk about the last time you were on. Um, but Thank you for bringing that up again because it was to me that you said that because I am not in a position where I can take care of another living creature right now in that in that mm-hmm. full sense. So it does it does supplement that part of my path by engaging with plant spirits uh, and plant familiars instead. So if you're feeling like you have to have a, a, a someone to take care of to be your familiar a plant entity is fine thank you for saying that uh, very important and necessary so was it difficult when you when you agreed to write the grimoire and you and I know you've just submitted it um, was it difficult 
for you to share your personal spells and practices because a lot of people hold those very close to the vest and they'll they'll give instructions here's something you can do here's something you can try and and all spell work is like that but as you mentioned this is from your personal practice was that difficult to like release into the world no <laughs> um i think that <laughs> no <laughs> no no Raina. <laughs> The more visceral and the more real that I can be with everybody about this and just, yeah. you know, sharing my own personal journey, my past experiences, you know, what I'm doing now, what I'm doing, you know, magically, spiritually, all of that is is really like the most sort of precious thing that that I can offer to people and the the poison path grimoire is is very much like a manifestation of this personal journey and exploration that I've been on in sort of looking at the parallels between poison and the parallels between witchcraft and how that can be tapped into as a magical energy um, in and of itself and showing people that, you know, it's not all about the the entheogenic effects and and the flying ointment and having these really, you know, Mm -hmm. profound, perceptible, psychoactive, for lack of a better word, experiences, Um, but kind of getting back to really, really just working with them magically in ritual, in spell work, um, and really tapping into those, those energies. Be prepared, folks, because I have the feeling that there's going to be select warning labels <laughs> with certain cells. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, there's always a disclaimer, and, and I focus a lot on the idea of, of dark herbalism and sort of investigating yeah. some of these more sinister plant associations that we have and, and what that means for us as magical practitioners and understanding the, the spiritual side of those associations. I want you to know how much I love you for that because the the need, the need in the population for it all has to be love and light and it all has to be coming up roses and everybody's got to be happy, happy, happy. No, it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I love how real you are about, I mean, and you were totally real in the first book too. So it's no surprise. But I'm I'm so excited about learning the correct ways to implement. It's so important. It's not like, here, I'm going to hand you a bunch of poison and give you absolutely no fucking idea of how dangerous this can be. And it's really important that we not run with scissors in the snowstorm. I'm just saying. It's, so I, I love the fact that you do that. I love the fact that you're very factual about it and you do warn folks, listen, this is not a game. These are not toys. There are real consequences for misusing these or doing these things. And I think people need that impressed upon them more than ever because there's still this thought in some folks' heads of, well, but it won't happen to me. Oh, but it will happen to you. So please, when you read instructions, if someone tells you only put this number of drops in the potion, follow the instructions because things do have consequences for good or bad. Everything has a price attached to it, no matter what it is. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love it. I'm so excited for this room to come out. And I'm really glad that you're, you're, you're comfortable enough because a lot of people, they hold it really close to the vest. They don't want to say too much. They don't want to share too much. You're always so open about everything and so 100% yourself about it. And I think that's why people are so attracted to you and the way you write and the things you write about. Thank you. That really means a lot. 
Oh, so. All stuff that's very near, near and dear to my heart. <laughs> well, you're near and dear to our hearts, too. I just want you to know that. You're, you mm. definitely explore things in a way that is very unique, and you don't really pull any punches, and you're very plain about what consequences there are and can be. And, and I just find it refreshing because a lot of people are like, well... Coulda, woulda, shoulda. You really shouldn't, but and and you don't really mouth it. And that's also another thing I love about you. You're like, this is what it is, and play with it at your own risk. Just know what you're getting into. And I think books that give that information um, need to be more present, not less so. You know, I think when we try too hard to protect everybody's feelings. And, you know, well, you don't want to stunt the child's growth. Yes, but you don't want the child, again, to run with scissors in a snowstorm. Um, Not that I'm saying your readers are children. I'm just saying, you know, in our innocence, sometimes we do something stupid because we don't know better. You at least make sure we do know better and that we have no excuses into our own hands in a way that's inappropriate. Just saying, I've been known to do that. And I suffered the consequences from making mistakes that I knew were mistakes up front. But, yeah, sometimes I just have to put my hand on that stove, even though you told me it was hot. I'm a bad girl. But you know what I'm saying? No one can fault you for for hiding the facts, for sure. So when do we think the new book will come out? Oh, well, the wheels of, of publishing move a little bit slowly, and there will probably be some back and forth as far as um, editing before the final manuscript gets sent in to print. So I would say probably a year or so. That's okay. We can talk about it in a year or so when it comes out. That would be fine with me. I hope that would oh, be yeah. fine with you. Okay, Definitely. Cool. Um. Are you working on any other collaborations, and are you interested in working on more collaborations? Um, I'm not working on any like current writing collaborations, um, but I'm always interested in in working with other people and and connecting other people and using whatever resources or experiences that I have to help you know elevate what we're all doing and make it better and make more people know about it and really right now my focus is kind of on specifically the poison path and there's all of these other amazing practitioners out there and just wanting to do more work with them and kind of showcase um, you know the work that they're doing because my poison path is very very different from everybody else's poison path um, that's right. been doing it for years so I think that's what's next. So other other writers, other writers, listen up. Kobe Michael is a treasure. Seriously, if you can collaborate with him, please do. Please do. Just saying, putting it out there, putting out that energy. Um, I, I think you're a great writer. I really do. I think you have a lot to say. I think you have so much more to still offer. I hope you are writing many, many books for many, many years to come. And I am so honored and delighted that you agreed to come on and hang out with me. But before we go, we've got a few minutes left. Tell folks how they can find you and catch up with you and and read more of what you've written. Please. You can find all of the articles that I've written since 2016 on Papios Pagan at papios.com slash blogs slash poisoners apothecary. You can also visit my website where I've got all of the poison path formulas, jewelry, all sorts of different offerings at thepoisonersapothecary.com. Um, there's also a blog there. And if you're interested in going really deep into the poison path, you can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash poisoners apothecary, Um, as well as all of the the social medias, Instagram, um, poisoners apothecary discussion group on Facebook is open to everyone. Um, That's kind of its own sort of self-running community. There's a lot of really awesome 
um, poison path practitioners on there sharing their their journey and experiences and some really awesome you know just like plant porn what we call it <laughs> <laughs> plant porn, oh my gosh. tell people a little <laughs> bit more about the patreon what are your tiers and and all that good stuff um, the Patreon, the highest tier is the Pharmacos tier, and that's $17 a month. And I do sort of semi-annual mystery boxes of samples from different formulas that I offer on the website, some that are not on the website. Um, and then you're just getting lots of really in-depth articles and herbal monographs on, um, you know, one particular plant at a time and then I also go into depth on just information on extraction, preparation, um, you know, doing like Amanita muscaria extracts or working with Syrian rue or, you know, what's the best way to get tropane alkaloids out of plant material and into an oil medium for topical application and um, a lot of the more kind of scientific uh, phytochemistry and, and things like that, but then also very much, you know, grounded in, in witchcraft and, and magical practice too. Uh, and I try and do all of my presentations that are hosted online or, or recorded on video. I also will put those up there as well. So you're getting access to like all of my workshops and classes and stuff that I do around the country. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot of stuff. That's it a great a deal. <laughs> Very cool. That that is a lot, a lot. I mean, because you really put a lot of work into what you do. It's it's kind of amazing. So I would encourage folks if this is something you're interested in, I would definitely encourage you to to get on his Patreon. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you one stupid question, if it's okay before we go. Is it okay? Yeah, I love stupid questions. Okay, good. <laughs> so, when I, so when I was a kid, I was told that mandrake roots, when you pull them from the ground, scream. Is that true? No. <laughs> okay. It's it's just something that stuck with me from childhood. I was always told that if you pulled a mandrake root from the ground, it would scream. I don't know why I, mean... I thought that was true. <laughs> It's such a, a prevalent sort of folklore attached to the mandrake that it lets out that scream. I mean, there are some, some really uh -huh. hefty, large mandrake roots. You get sort of like a, a groaning of the earth as you're you're pulling them out, but I wouldn't I wouldn't equate it to a scream. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, it's just it's just a piece of lore that I've had since childhood and I just wanted you to to answer that once and for all so I can stop thinking it. Because I, I mean, because this is what I was told from being a little girl. So, okay, cool. Mandrakes do not scream literally when you pull them out of the ground. Period. End of mythology on that one. Kobe, thank <laughs> you so much again for being on with me. Please come back for the new book when, when you're getting ready to release it, would you? Yeah, absolutely. It would be my pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you again. Have a wonderful weekend, and I appreciate you hanging out with me. Thanks, Raina. Have a great night. Thanks for listening, everyone. You too. Thanks. All right, guys, I'll see you next week. In the meantime, take care of yourselves. Oh, program note. I do not have COVID. I do not even have a fever. So I'm just feeling overrun and tired, which is fine. <laughs> And I think our guest definitely made me feel better. So I hope you guys had a great week, and I hope you have an even better weekend. Take care, everybody. I'll see you next time.